It rose from the water like a steel ghost. Enormous, silent, impossible. A machine so strange it felt unreal, yet it was very real and very dangerous. They nicknamed it the Caspian Sea Monster. A Cold War experiment skimming above the waves, confusing satellites, and terrifying analysts who had no idea what they were really seeing. It was not a ship, not an airplane. It lived between those worlds, a hybrid built to race above the sea while carrying weapons no normal vessel could escape. It was not a ship, not an airplane. It lived between those worlds, a hybrid built to race above the sea while carrying weapons no normal vessel could escape. Today we go inside its story why the Soviet Union built these giants, why they frightened NATO, and why such extraordinary machines eventually disappeared from the world's oceans. An Akranoplan flew using ground effect a cushion of compressed air trapped beneath wide wings. It let an extremely heavy craft glide just a few meters above the surface. Airliners feel this during landing, a little extra lift. Akranoplans live there constantly surfing on that cushion in a narrow band where speed and disaster sat side by side. From the cockpit, there was no comfort zone. Too high and you lost the cushion. Too low and the next wave could slam straight into the machine's heavy belly and wings. The Akranoplan promised aircraft speed with ship-like carrying capacity, but it demanded constant attention. The sea, the wind, and the engines fought for control every second of the flight. On paper, it looked perfect, fast, stealthy, powerful. In reality, it was a fragile deal with nature itself, and nature never signs long-term agreements without a hidden price. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union hunted for weapons that could outrun NATO fleets and overwhelm coastal defenses. Speed alone was not enough. They needed something unexpected. NATO radar watched the skies for bombers and missiles. Ekranoplans tried to slip underneath that watchful gaze, racing along the sea where few expected a sudden strike. Planners imagined fleets of these craft launching from remote bases, delivering missiles, troops, or supplies at speed ships could never reach while staying below most radar coverage. To make that vision real, Engineers needed brute force engines big enough to lift apartment blocks, wings broad enough to trap entire carpets of compressed air above the sea. Money, metal, and political backing poured into the project. Success meant rewriting naval strategy. Failure meant creating the world's most expensive, most dangerous dead-end experiment. The first true giant was the KM, a vast ground effect ship tested on the Caspian Sea. To Western satellites, it looked like an impossibly large aircraft, somehow flying low. In truth, it barely flew. It skimmed, hovering on its air cushion, while huge engines blasted spray backward, carving long white scars of wake across the water behind it. But power came with chaos. The KM lived inside a narrow envelope too high and it lost lift. Too low and the next jagged wave could rip metal open instantly. Pilots watched instruments with absolute focus. Unlike a normal airplane, they had no altitude buffer. Just a thin shifting layer between the sea below and disaster above. The KM proved the idea could work at immense scale but it also proved how brutally unforgiving that edge of the atmosphere can be when so much weight depends on it staying stable. Flying just meters above water meant living with constant anxiety. The surface is never truly flat. Every swell gust and reflection tries to drag the craft off balance. Pilots fought invisible hands, Pockets of rising air, sudden dips, crosswinds hiding between waves. An Akrano plan never simply cruised it demanded continuous, exhausting correction from everyone on board. Stormy weather grounded them immediately. Even modest waves turned low, fast flight into a gamble no commander wanted, especially with cruise fuel and expensive prototypes at risk. Unlike ships, they could not ride out rough seas. Unlike aircraft, they could not climb safely above storms. 
They were trapped in the most volatile layer of all. Cruz respected the machine and feared it. The crano plans offered breathtaking speed but punished hesitation instantly, turning minor misjudgments into catastrophic career-ending failures. Sooner or later, that volatility won. During a test flight, the KM misjudged its altitude. The nose dipped, water surged upward, and the giant struck the sea with brutal force. Rescue teams arrived quickly, but the machine was gone, swallowed by the same sea it once dominated. The crash shattered confidence across the project and its leadership. Investigations blamed turbulence, structural stresses, and pilot overload. But the deeper truth was harsher. The design itself demanded perfection in a world that almost never provides it. Inside military offices, enthusiasm cooled. Meetings slowed, budgets froze, and momentum died. The Soviet dream of giant ground-effect monsters cracked deeply on that single unlucky day. Yet the concept refused to die. Some argued the KM was only a first draft and overambitious prototype. If lessons were learned, a new generation might still succeed. The next major design was the Lund-class Ikranoplan, a missile carrier built not for testing, but for attack. Its purpose was simple race and strike hard and vanish again. The Lund carried heavy anti-ship missiles along its spine, turning the entire craft into a low-flying strike platform. To any sailor watching the horizon, it would look like doom approaching. In theory, it could attack carrier groups before they were ready, hugging the sea-launching missiles, then retreating under the radar line. On paper, it was terrifying. In practice, it still had to obey physics, maintenance schedules, and weather forecasts. Power meant nothing if waves were too high, engines temperamental, or spare parts difficult to find. Today, the last lung class hall rests beached near Darabent, a rusting giant beside the water, looking more like a grounded creature from legend than a cutting-edge weapon system. Another branch of the project produced the Orleonox smaller, tougher, focused on transport. It looked less like a monster and more like a rugged, fast-moving utility vehicle. The Orleonoc could skim along coasts, land on rough beaches, and move troops or vehicles quickly across inland seas. For planners, it promised flexible mobility and difficult terrain. Yet the old problems returned. Keeping these craft flying required intense inspection, difficult repairs and careful scheduling, shortening their useful lifespans and adding heavy hidden costs. Technicians worked long hours checking metal for fatigue fighting corrosion from saltwater spray and replacing components worn out far faster than optimistic early estimates had ever suggested. Only a few Orleanox were completed. They appeared occasionally, then faded quietly from regular service as more conventional transport aircraft and ships continued doing their jobs reliably. Beneath every flight lay the same uncomfortable truth ground effect giants survived only inside a delicate balance. If that balance tipped, there was rarely enough time or space to recover. Imagine driving at highway speed over a road that constantly moves and twists. That was a cranoplan piloting, reacting to a surface that never stayed loyal for very long. Huge forces slammed through the structure during sudden corrections and tight turns. Each maneuver pumped stress into spars, joints, and panels, slowly shrinking lifespans that were already optimistic. Every extra ton of reinforcement added weight. Every added system increased complexity. The more they tried to fix weaknesses, the further the machines drifted from their original promise. Compared to submarines, bombers, and conventional warships, Ikrano plans became difficult to justify, too specialized, too demanding, and too vulnerable to forces that commanders could not simply order away. As the Soviet Union neared its final years, money ran thin. Ambitious experiments faced brutal reviews, and Ikrano plans, with all their complexity, were easy targets for budget cuts. Leaders turned toward proven tools, missiles, submarines, and aircraft that fit familiar doctrines. The strange hybrids skimming above the sea no longer matched the new colder financial reality. 
Projects were delayed, then canceled. Units were mothballed crews reassigned and spare parts stopped arriving. Enormous machines became stranded hulks parked along lonely coasts and silent shipyards. By the time the Soviet Union collapsed, a chronoplan development had effectively stalled. Without a superpower funding the dream, no other Navy rushed to inherit such a heavy, uncertain burden. What remained were isolated survivors. A Lund hull here, an Orleanoc there, half relics, half warnings, marking the end of one of the boldest experiments in naval history. Engineers and enthusiasts still debate them. Some argue a chrono plans were ahead of their time. Others say they were a spectacular answer to a question nobody truly needed solved. Today, small ground effect craft reappear in Netch Roll's Tourism Patrol Rapid Coastal Transport. These designs are modest on purpose, avoiding the extreme scale that doomed their Soviet ancestors. A few military studies quietly revisit the concept, asking whether drones and smarter control systems could finally tame that unstable air cushion between sea and sky. So far, answers remain cautious. The same obstacles remain, stubborn weather waves, corrosion maintenance, narrow mission profiles. Against those problems, conventional aircraft missiles and submarines still look safer, simpler, and more flexible. Some ideas vanish because they fail completely. Ekrano plans disappeared for a subtler reason they worked, just not well enough often enough or cheaply enough to survive changing priorities. The sea keeps its own counsel. For a brief era, giant Soviet machines tried to skim across its surface and outrun its moods. In the end, the sea simply waited. Today we remember them as steel legends, bold, flawed, unforgettable. One rusting hull still faces the water, staring toward waves it will never rise to meet again. Somewhere future engineers may revisit these blueprints with better computers and stronger materials, wondering whether they can finally tame that unstable space between sea and sky. Maybe drones will try where human crews struggled, letting algorithms handle turbulence and waves. If that happens, Ekrano plans might return, smaller stranger but spiritually the same machines. Until then, the giants rest where they fell. As you watch their footage, ask yourself, were they a brilliant mistake or a glimpse of technology the world simply wasn't ready to support yet?